Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the third in a five-part series about entirety. We're looking at the whole of reality, which is obviously a huge topic, couldn't possibly be covered in a single talk or five of them. To make it a little more manageable, we're using the venerable four elements system that is employed in many spiritual traditions. This was all discussed in the first talk of this series. And we're now on the third talk where we're taking up the subject of the water element. Now we'll be looking at water both from a physical standpoint and also from a more metaphorical one. In the course of this talk, we'll also be looking at one of the three approaches that mindful biology offers, specifically the approach that uses biological and scientific knowledge and basic facts to help us dissolve our sense of separation from the natural world, from our bodies, from one another. In other words, we'll be using mindful biology as a sort of non-dual practice. Looking at water from a chemical standpoint, it has this formula that we're familiar with, H2O, and it has a shape somewhat uh, as indicated by the artist's conception. We'll come back to that shape in a bit. We'll be talking about water's liquid properties. So we're talking here about liquid water as opposed to solid or gaseous forms. You may recall from the first uh, talk that the four elements line up fairly well with the four phases of matter, solid, liquid, gaseous, and plasma. Clearly, if we're talking about the water element, we're talking about this liquid phase, but we do know that water occurs in a solid form we call ice. I introduced this last time. When water is in the ice configuration, when it's solid, the molecules are arranged in a very regular three-dimensional pattern, essentially a crystal. And the connections between the individual molecules, one to the next, tend to be tight and strong. So the molecules move around a little bit, but not very much, they maintain their position. If we heat the ice, of course it melts. As it melts, a lot of this changes. The tight connections between the water molecules are lost, the regular arrangement is also lost, and the water takes on a more disorganized appearance on the molecular level. So if we compare the liquid phase with the solid phase in the case of water, we can see the loss of regularity on the left, and we can also see that the water molecules are packed a little more closely together on the left than the right. That is to say, when they're solid, when they're ice, there's more space between the molecules, and this makes ice less dense than liquid water. And that explains the you know, everyday fact that ice floats. This is why it floats. Well, we're going to be looking at the liquid state of matter in this talk, and particularly liquid water as it occurs in the human body. I think we're all aware that water makes up about 50 to 60 percent of a human body. There's variability in that number because there's a variability in fat content from one body to the next. But regardless of the individual body, it's clear that there's a lot of water in it, and this water is essential to life and health. It needs to be maintained. Well, there's a problem there from the standpoint of an organism because water is constantly lost. It's most obviously lost when we urinate, which of course we do several times a day, but it's also lost through our breath, through our skin, and in our feces. So there's this ongoing loss of water from the body, and obviously that needs to be replaced, and so we imbibe water and we take water in with our foodstuffs to maintain the balance. So there's this ongoing movement or cycling of water through the body. It comes in from the environment, the body makes use of it for a time, and then it exits back to the environment. That cycling of water within the human body is part of a larger cycle of water throughout the biosphere. So we have these large collections of water we call lakes and oceans. The sunlight strikes them, they warm up, some of the water evaporates, it rises into the atmosphere, it collects up there, 
Uh, it gets a little bit cooler, it condenses and forms clouds, and if there's enough water and things cool and conditions are correct, then the rain will fall. And the water lands back uh, either in the ocean or on land, and if it lands on you know, dry land, then it eventually makes its way back to the ocean through streams or underground aquifers and so on. And another path it might follow on its way back is through a human body. So we're drinking water every day. Uh, in, in one way or another, that water is coming out of the sky as rain. And one way or another, it's going to make its way back to the oceans. So the larger point here is that water is flowing all the time. It's flowing through our bodies and it's flowing through the biosphere. So this is one of the three characteristics of water that we're going to emphasize in this talk. Now, water moves on all scales. You know, it moves through our bodies and through our blood vessels and even the smallest blood vessels, the little capillaries, but it also moves through oceans, you know, these vast collections of water on Earth. One of the most famous uh, paths of water movement in the ocean is the Gulf Stream, which draws warm water out of the region of the Caribbean, conveys it along the eastern seaboard uh, up to the North Atlantic. It's because of this current that the New England states are considerably warmer than regions at the same latitude in Europe. Well, the Gulf Stream is famous, but it's hardly the only current in the ocean. There are many others. And we can kind of scan the globe quickly and see quite a few of them coming into view in different regions. A feature of these things is that they tend to look relatively stable over time, even though they're constantly changing and fluctuating a little bit they maintain a certain stability and pattern. So for instance, the Gulf Stream has been identifiable uh, throughout the entire time that people have been observing it. So the flow of water through our bodies connects us with the flow of water from sky to land to ocean. It connects us with the flow of water in the ocean in those vast currents and many other situations where water moves from one place to another in this natural process that liquids show that we call flow. This is a good time to take a moment to contemplate these truths and embody them in a meditation. So I would encourage pausing at this point, giving this a little bit of thought and feeling into your body and noticing its liquid qualities and the feelings of flow that can be found there. And then restart the video. So again, going back to the human body and all of its water, we've been talking so far more physically. I'd like to now begin to talk a little more metaphorically. The Taoists in China were quite aware that water has special qualities. And they looked at those qualities as providing some guidance to humans who want to live wisely. And Lao Tzu, the founding sage of Taoism said, nothing in the world is soft and yielding as water. There's actually a second part to this saying that we'll get to, but to begin with, let's emphasize the importance of softness in the experience of a liquid and in particular in the experience of water. Perhaps one biological area where softness is most in view is during nursing. When a mother's mammary glands secrete this liquid nutrient we call milk, you know, a very watery secretion, and the little offspring suckles at the breast and is thereby nourished. You know, that all sounds biological, a little bit physical. There's this flow of milk from one organism to the next. But of course, on an emotional level, there's a whole lot more going on, a lot of uh, deep feeling, etc. So this softness comes in at all of those levels. There's the softness of the tissue, the skin, the breast, the little baby. There's the softness of the milk, the wateriness of it and the flow of it. And there's the softness of the loving emotions. Okay, so here's this soft quality in water in addition to the flow.
When I gave the series that precedes this one about vitality, I brought in the idea that there's a connection between vitality and what in Chinese medicine is referred to as qi. It goes by other names in other tradi traditions. This is an energetic sensation that we have in our bodies that uh, has connections to health and well-being. I think most of us know that within the Chinese medicine system, if the flow of qi is easy and smooth and unobstructed, we tend to feel alive and vibrant. But if it's blocked in some way, and if it pools and doesn't move you know, smoothly, doesn't flow freely, then discomfort and illness can follow. But when it's flowing well, we do have this quality of vibrancy and aliveness, and this can really be felt throughout the whole body, the flow and the you know, kind of lively, slightly vibrating quality of qi can be felt. One needs to get a little sensitive to feel it, but it's not hard to find that experience in the body. Some places make it more obvious than others. It's easier, for instance, to feel in the heart region often. But within the Chinese medicine systems and within uh, related martial arts, the emphasis actually is on connecting with the quality of energetic presence lower in the body, in the so-called dantian, the region uh, above the pelvis and below the uh, belly button. This lower belly region is considered to be a good place to center one's awareness because it is stable and it's less affected by the transient ups and downs of emotional life that are felt in the heart region. In the talk from the last class series, when I drew the parallel between qi and vitality, I also constructed an analogy that compared qi to the water flowing over a water wheel such as we see and compared vitality to the power that comes out. So there's this structural arrangement in a water wheel. Now there's plenty of structure in the human body and when it comes to flow, one of the most important is the human heart, which actively pumps blood through the body and is clearly related to our vitality. So if our heart is in good shape, we can exercise vigorously, we have you know, a lot of energy, we don't feel overly tired or out of breath, etc. So the heart is related to this sense of vitality. And the heart is powerful. And qi has a power to it. And the water wheel has you know, its own power. So the flow aspect is connected quite tightly to the quality of power, personal biological power. And so we can now bring in that second part of the saying from Lao Tzu, nothing in the world is as soft and yielding as water, but to compel the hard and unyielding, it has no equal, All right? So this is the deep, and profound truth that Taoism takes to heart, which is that oftentimes true power is allied very closely with gentle softness. And water exemplifies the reason why that makes sense. And we can also think about how relaxing and easing into the flow of life helps us feel more vigorous, makes life flow more easily, and gives us a sense of authenticity and authority. So we've talked about water and flow from two sides now, one being a little more physical and chemical, you know, the pumping heart, the water molecules, and the other being a little more metaphorical uh, and subjective, the feel of energy in the body, our connection to vitality, etc. And I wanna go a little further with this subjective side of things. You know, what does life feel like on the interior of the body and in the felt day-to-day -day business of human life? What aspects of our experience are most related to the water element? One answer anyway is emotion. You know, emotions tend to flow one to the next. They've got a kind of surging and powerful energy. They can be a little bit soft and squirrely. They're not real easy to pin down. So they have all of these watery qualities. Many of us have learned to be a little bit 
emotionally guarded as adults, but we surely were not that way when we were little. And if we look at a young child such as this one, we can really see the flow of emotions. He, this video that we're going to watch was taken by his mother or maybe someone filming the mother as she sang uh, songs from operas to the child. And the child clearly likes some of the songs better than others. And you can read his face quite easily and see just this very rapid and spontaneous and you know unfiltered emotional expression. So as the songs change, his reactions change, and it's easy to read on his face. And you and I have learned to dampen a lot of that down, but it's still going on inside. The emotions are still shifting and changing. And this, this brings us into contact with the metaphorical aspect of the water element. And so we've got all this stuff going on inside us, all these emotions. And they can be you know, kind of disruptive to our daily lives. They can help us Sometimes they can connect us with our passions and what we authentically value, but they can also set us off, uh, lead to unskillful behavior, things that we regret. And so it can really be skillful to learn to center one's awareness a little lower down in that Dantian region that's more uh, quiescent, it doesn't quite get tugged around to the extent of the emotional centers and gives us a sense of a solid base from which the flowing can be observed and appreciated. And so this is another opportunity now to stop the video and maybe feel into your own emotional condition. You might even want to enact some emotions, happiness, sadness, collapse, pride, and just sort of feel how you can set energy moving in your body by adopting different body postures, etc and then restart the video. So I want to return again to the water molecule H2O. We're seeing another drawing here of the molecule and I want to talk a little at this point about the special properties of water that make it so important to life. So the large ball that you see there is oxygen and it carries a relative negative charge and the little balls are hydrogen that carry a relative positive charge. Now, because the hydrogen atoms are not directly opposite one another, because they're angled and kind of close to each other, there is an electrical polarity in water that is unusual. It's not that common that chemicals have polarity in this way. And this makes water very special. One way in which water is special is that when it's in its liquid form, there's a jostling that goes on and bonds are formed between the negative regions and the positive regions. These are temporary and relatively weak bonds, not nearly as strong as the ones that form in liquid ice, although they're related, uh, but they're, and they're forming and breaking all the time. But they make water quite a bit more cohesive than it would be without this polarity. And one example of that cohesion is the way that little organisms like the water strider can actually walk right on the surface of liquid water, something that wouldn't be possible in, a, in an oil, for instance. Water has greater surface tension as a consequence of its polarity. But there's another consequence of the polarity that's even more important for our purposes, and that is that water is a good solvent for salts. So salts are made up of positive and negative chemical entities that bind together by virtue of their opposite charges. A good example is table salt sodium chloride. It has the features of any solid, which is the regular arrangement and the tight bonds. In this case, though, there is this additional factor that the atoms are oppositely charged. And so there are extremely strong attractions between positive and negative charges that lead to the formation of this you know, crystalline hard substance that we call table salt. But something very special happens when it drops into water. Because of the polarity of water, it's able to coax 
the negatively charged chloride and the positively charged sodium, it coaxes them to separate and move into solution. And so the negative chloride is attracted toward the positive hydrogen end, and the positive sodium is attracted toward the negative oxygen side of the H2O molecule. And this capacity of water to dissolve sodium chloride and other salts really makes life possible because life is built in some important ways around dissolved salts or ions as they're called. Probably the easiest way to get a handle on how important it is is to look at a nerve cell, a neuron. Neurons actively exclude sodium from their interior. They pump it out so that they maintain a low sodium concentration on the inside. And this is really vital to their function. When they send a nerve signal to another nerve cell, the signal is developed as a result of this concentration gradient with the low sodium in and the high sodium out. What happens is a transient pulse of sodium floods into the cell, changes the electrical signal on the inside of the cell, and then that signal for various uh, biological reasons propagates down uh, to the next cell in the circuit. The signal looks something like this with a sharp spike. That upward spike represents the movement of the sodium into the cell and the rapid change in electrical polarity. So this is the basis of nerve propagation and it would not be possible if water wasn't a solvent for salts as it is. So this is, in a sense, you know, one of the reasons why water is such an important biological liquid. And I think this starts to bring in the sense that water is a pretty powerful substance, particularly when we look at how capable the collections of nerve cells that we call brains are. So here we're looking at a slice of brain tissue. Only about one in every 1,000 nerve cells is even stained here. Most of them are not visible, but we see a you know, tiny fraction of the ones that are available. But you can see how densely packed they are. And this is an extremely you know, small region of brain tissue. So there's an enormous number of neurons, uh, typically quoted around 85 billion in the brain, all of them dependent on sodium, uh, and all of them capable of talking and communicating with one another, talking in the sense of intercellular communication. So here's this brain that has water in it, just as the human body does. In fact, the brain has a higher percentage of water, more like 75%. And so the brain is you know, really quite watery, and given its tremendous power for, you know, to give us consciousness and our ability to speak and everything else that humans and other animals can do, I think deservedly can be called powerful, this capacity of the brain, which in a certain sense is the capacity of water, which is what we're talking about. And so if as humans we look out upon an ocean, in a certain sense there's water on the inside and water on the out, and it's water looking at water. So we're getting now to this idea of dissolving the boundaries, the sense of inside and outside. We looked at how water is cycling through us, that connects us with the environment in a way that makes us less separate from it. We looked at the ongoing flow of emotions. I didn't say much about it, but humans are you know, very resonant in their emotions. We vibrate off one another in emotional ways so that there's a kind of field of emotion that we can sometimes detect when we're in the presence of others. And then there's a sense in which the human nervous system you know, sees water in the environment, but is also water on its interior, highly structured, of course, but definitely very watery. And so there's you know, water on both sides, right? Water on the inside, water on the outside, water looking at water in a certain sense. And so we have this watery brain in a watery world, and we're connected with it in many ways, and we're living with our watery experience of flowing emotions and feelings. And it's really worth, I think, spending some time appreciating this quality of liquidity and flow, softness and power in the body. And so as we end this video, I encourage you to sit and contemplate what's been discussed and see if you can feel into your body, feel the moistness in your mouth, for instance, 
Feel the vibration of your blood flow and feel the more subtle vibrations of the flowing energies. Thank you for watching.